There are different patterns for different kinds of crime, so not all kinds of crime are falling. We saw a bit of that in the first presentation and the second as well, actually. Um, there's, if we sort of consider the four different kinds of crime we're going to be focusing on in this presentation, there's a clear drop for motor vehicle crimes, but there's actually an increase for assaults and threats. For household crimes, there is a drop, but then it levels out. And for personal thefts and robberies, there isn't any real change. However, not everybody's experience of crime is the same. There's been some previous research done by, again, my colleague Paul Norris, but with um, another researcher, Tim Hope, where they identified several different groups of victims. And these groups differed in the amount of crime they experienced, but also in the mix of crime. And they were looking at property crime and personal crime separately, and they looked both for Scotland and for England and Wales, and they found similar things um, in both those cases. So we might ask, is this crime drop due to a change in the sizes of the groups? Is it that the groups which experience more crime are becoming smaller over time? Are more people belonging to groups which experience less crime? Is that why we're getting a crime drop? Or is it a case of all of the groups staying the same size, but the experience is changing so that for all of the groups, they, people in those groups are experiencing less crime as time goes on? Or is it both of those things happening? A related question, do all victims of crime experience the same drop in crime, or is the crime drop different for different groups? So we're going to be looking at Scottish data using the Scottish Crime and Justice Survey. There's been nine sweeps so far that we have data for, starting in 1993 and going up to 2010 to 2011. It's different respondents every time. It's not a panel survey, so we can't follow people up over time, unfortunately. Um, and we're merging all of the sweeps into a single data set. Now, as it's a stratified sample, there are weights, um, sampling weights. What we've done so that each of the years is given an equal weight because um, there are different numbers of respondents in each year from about 3,000 in um, 2004 to over 16,000 in 2008-2009 to cope with those sort of different sizes so that we're treating all years equally. We're actually rescaling those sampling weights so they all add, add up to the same um, value. So this is um, a diagram, and actually I should, before I um, come to this, I meant to say at the beginning, I should warn you that whenever there's like, a diagram or a graph, then there's going to be a slide afterwards which sort of talks about the diagram or graph, which I'll just skip over because I've just said all of that. The slides are there because, you know, if you want to go and look at the slides later, I want them to still be understandable when I'm not standing here talking. So that's why there's going to be skipping in places. This is um, showing the incidents creation process for the Scottish Crime and Justice Survey. And I don't have time to go into all of the details, but you can see from this that it's a very complex multi-stage process. And there have been changes um, from sweep to sweep in all of these stages. They've mostly been minor changes, fortunately. Um, we have actually been able to introduce a little bit more consistency in a couple of these places in terms of which crimes we group together to calculate incidence rates for. We've been able to choose those consistently um, from sweep to sweep. And in terms of which um, incidents are counted as being eligible, because, I mean, even in the official survey, it's always been the case that incidents are eligible if they happened in Scotland and during the year-long reference period. But the details of how that was implemented did vary somewhat from sweep to sweep. We've been a little bit more consistent there. We've also chosen not to look at sexual offences because they were more affected by the changes from sweep to sweep. So we're going to um, look at four groups of crime that we've created. We've got motor vehicle crime, household crime, assaults and threats, and personal thefts and robberies. Okay, so here are the technical details for those that are interested in them. We run a latent class model, um, and we've capped our incidences at four. That's basically to get the model to run. We tried, first of all, not capping them or capping them at a lower value, but it turned out in order to get the model to run at all, we needed to cap them at four. So we've treated them as an ordinal response. We haven't put any explanatory variables in the model. We would have liked to put time in, but again, it turned out if you do that, the model didn't run, so we had to leave that out. Because it's a latent class model, the groups we identified are technically called classes, but I'm going to carry on calling them groups. 
um, because we didn't have time in the model, the way we've investigated change over time, once you've run the model, you can get a predicted probability of belonging to each group for each individual. And then, of course, we have different individuals in different time periods, so that allows us to take um, the average probability for each of our time periods, each sweep um, of the survey. And similarly, for looking at changes in the number of incidents experienced by each group over time, we do that in the same way. Okay, so what do we find? Well, it turns out that a four-group model fits best for our data. So um, we've got a group that we're calling non-victims. That's the green ones. Oh, there isn't a lazy thing. Fair enough. That's the green ones here. Um, and they, in fact, do have a small risk of experiencing any kind of crime. They're not really non-victims, but they're practically non-victims. You can see they have only a very, very small risk, so we're calling them non-victims. Then we have one-off victims, so they experience, on average, about one incident each, and it's likely to be of either motor vehicle or household crime. The household victims experience, on average, about two incidents each, um, and you can see that they're the most likely victims to experience household crime, and that's also the most likely crime for them. They also, though, have um, a high risk, well, we used to be high risk of motor vehicle crime and assaults and threats. You can see they have a similar um, average uh, risk of motor vehicle crime to the one-off victims and, a, as I say, a reasonably high uh, risk of assaults and threats. And then finally we've got the personal victims. They have um, a similar risk of the household crimes to the one-off victims, but as you can see the most dramatic risk for them is personal theft and robbery and particularly assaults and threats. Personal theft and robbery, you can see that that's the only group that has um, a risk that isn't really, really small. Um, much, much higher than the risk for any of the other groups. And for assaults and threats, again, um, okay, in this case, the household victims do have a reasonable risk of assaults and threats, but still the personal victims have a risk that is much, much higher. And they experience around three incidents in total on average. So that's the um, average number of incidents experienced by each group. But we can look now at um, the probability of experiencing each number of incidents. So... We've got here the non-victims. You can see that about 90% of the non-victims don't experience any incidents of any kind of crime. And most of the ones who do experience some crime are only experiencing one incident. For the one-off and the household victims, if you remember that the average number of incidents was about two for the household victims and only about one for the one-off victims. But you can see they've actually got quite similar probabilities of being a victim at all. Um, for both of them, a little less than 40% of them don't experience any incidents. The differences are that the one-off victims have a higher probability of experiencing just one incident, whereas the household victims have a higher probability of experiencing particularly four incidents, or, um, but also more incidents as well. And then for the personal victims, what's really striking here, you can see that just about no personal victims don't experience any crime. And in fact... Um, most of them are experiencing two or more incidents. So you can see for this group, crime is really quite severe. Looking at uh, motor vehicle crime in the same way, um, we can see here, if you remember, the household and the one-off victims had similar average uh, numbers of motor vehicle crime. But you can see, actually, there's some sort of differences in the distribution here. Um, the one-off victims are actually more likely to experience an incident of motor vehicle crime at all um, but they're more likely for it just to be a single incident. The household victims, while they're less likely to experience any incidents of motor vehicle crime, they're also more likely to experience repeated incidents. You can see how um, the probability here of experiencing four or more um, incidents much greater than for the one-off victims. For household crime, um, if you remember, probably not, but on that graph where we were looking at the average number of incidents, there were about 0.8 incidents on average of household crime for the household victims, which you know, sounds like they're experiencing quite a lot. Actually, we can see here that um, about 60% of the household victims don't experience any household crime. The reason why that average is so high is because they have so much repeated victimisation, um, two incidents or even four or more incidents. <coughs> um, personal theft and robbery, this is, again, really dramatic. For the personal victims... Half of them, only half of them don't experience any incidents. The other half are experiencing one or more incidents. And in fact, 10% are experiencing two incidents or more. And we have a similar thing for assaults and threats. 
but even more dramatic here. Here, you, as you can see, just about no personal victims don't experience any assaults or threats. And about half of them, well, a bit, I guess a bit, um, a, bit, a bit less than... No, probably about half of them, isn't it? Because uh, half of them are experiencing one, uh, one um, incident, so half of them are experiencing more than one incident. So they've got you know, a high chance of experiencing more than one um, assault or threat. Okay, so considering no change over time, this is looking at the probability of belonging to each group. So at the top here, we've got the probability of being a non-victim. And you can see that there's an increase in time there. So as time goes on, a greater proportion of people belong to the non-victim group. And we've got a corresponding decrease in the probability of being a one-off victim. There's also a decrease in the probability of being a household victim, which you can't really see on this graph because of the scale. But I did want to have all the lines on the same graph there. For the personal victims, there isn't any evidence of any change over time, though. We can see a bit more clearly um, on this sort of version of the graph. In this case, for each year, we've got the probability of belonging to each group in that year minus the probability of belonging to that group in 1993. So it's the difference from 1993. And we can really see here how the um, increase in the probability of being a non-victim is mirrored by a corresponding decrease, particularly in the probability of being a one-off victim but also in the probability of being a household victim. Looking now at um, how the number of incidents that each group experiences changes over time, considering motor vehicle crime first. Um, you remember we saw that the one-off and the household victims had similar numbers of incidents of motor vehicle crime on average. And in fact, they're following very similar patterns over time as well. For both of these groups, the m number of incidents of motor vehicle crime is decreasing over time. Um, and also, in fact, for the non-victims, even though they experience so few incidents to begin with, we can detect a change even for them over time. For the personal victims, there's a, a fall between 1993 and 1996, but there's actually no evidence of any further change after that. Similar kind of story for the household crime. Again, for household victims and one-off victims and even non-victims, the number of incidents they experience of household crime is decreasing over time. But for the personal victims, we do have this drop from 1993 to 1996, um, but after that, there's no further evidence of any change for the uh, personal victims. So they're sort of starting off in 1993 being more similar to the household victims, and then they have this drop and they become more like the one-off victims, but then there doesn't seem to be any further change. For personal thefts and robberies, it seems that there isn't any continuous sort of trend of change over time for any of the groups, at least you know, not that we can detect significantly. Um, what we have here basically is there's some high years and there's some low years for each group. However, it's not the same years for every group that are high and low. For assaults and threats, there's an increase for all the groups, but we, don't, we can't find any evidence of a sort of continuous linear increase. What we're able to detect is a period of years at the beginning when it's a bit lower, and then there's sort of a jump and a period of years at the end when it's higher. And the, where the change happens is different for each group. For the personal victims, the change is sort of coming here after 2000. For the uh, household victims, it's coming after 1996. For the one-off victims and the non-victims, it's coming after 2004. And then if we look at total crime, putting all of that together, then um, again for the household victims, the one-off victims and the non-victims, we have a decrease over time. But for the personal victims, we don't have any evidence of any change over time. In this case, we don't even have um, a decrease from 1993 to 1996. There's just no evidence of any change for this group. So we've um, seen then that, okay, there's been a decrease in people belonging to not the personal victim group that experiences the most crime, but there's been a decrease in the proportion that belong to the household victims and the one-off victims. There's been an increase in the proportion belonging to the non-victim group. Um, so that's one sort of thing that might contribute to the crime drop, more people being in groups which experience less crime as time goes on. We've also seen that each group's experiences, again, not the personal victims, but the other three groups, they're all experiencing less crime as time goes on. So how do those um, contribute to the crime drop? Well, what I've drawn here is basically all of the crime for everybody added up together. So we can see that crime drop over time. 
Now if we just imagine what would have happened if we have those changes in group sizes, so we've still got all those people, blurred, well, we've still got more people being non-victims as time goes on, less people being one-off and household victims. So that's still happening. But if we pretend that the experiences of the, of the groups didn't change, the groups have the same average number of incidents over time. If that happened, then this is what we would see. So we can see that there's a bit of a drop there. So that suggests that the changes in the relative sizes of the group is making um, a, a small contribution, but it's making a contribution to the crime drop. If we sort of do the other thing, and we imagine that the group sizes had stayed the same over time, but that the experiences had changed, as we've seen, non-victims, one-off victims and household victims all experiencing less crime over time in the way that we saw on the previous graphs, then what we would get is this. So we can see that there's more of a drop due to those changing group experiences. So both of those things are contributing, but there's being more of an effect from, the, um, from each, well, apart from the personal victims, all of the other groups experiencing less, um, people in those groups experiencing less crime as time goes on. So conclusions, um, just to sort of summarise what I just said, we found four groups, um, non-victims, household victims, one-off victims, personal victims, and we found that the proportions um, in each group are changing, apart from the personal victims, who we didn't find any change for. We've got more non-victims as time goes on, less, um, fewer one-off and household victims. Um, we've also found different experiences for each group, so the total crime is reducing for the um, non-victims, one-off and household victims, but not for the personal victims. So what we've basically, what's coming out of this is that the personal victims, the ones who experience the most crime to begin with, these are the people who are least likely to see a reduction in crime. So, I mean, obviously, for one thing, that just seems quite unfair. You know, the people who already have the worst experience of crime, these are the people who the crime drop is not reaching. Also, however, this is sort of implying that the processes which are behind the crime drop, whatever those might be, they're not affecting the personal victims. So as these processes go on and more people move from the household and the one-off group to the non-victim group, um, and as the, the experience of crime decreases for these groups, eventually there's going to be a point where you've still got the personal victims. They're still there. They haven't um, reduced in the proportion that's still... Um, the same percentage of the population being personal victims and they're still having the same experience of crime. So, it, you know, it seems that there's maybe going to need to be different policies um, that can target this group to sort of carry on the, um, the crime drop for this group. So what we'd like to do in future, because obviously, you know, how can you target policies if you don't know who these people are? What we'd like to do is to add some explanatory variables to try and predict membership of the groups so that we can try and see who belongs to each group, what sort of predicts belonging to each group. And we've made just a very sort of small start on that. This is very preliminary, very exploratory analysis. Nothing <coughs> cool are going on at all here. This is stuff that might predict um, belonging to the personal victim group. So the top sort of two here, um, being under 25 and being male, are probably the ones that I've sort of got most sort of confidence in. I mean, I'm not sure that any of this is causal, but I've got the most confidence in that. It seems that a lot of the other things, they may be causal, but you, know, you could certainly um, imagine that a lot of these could be simply because of being under 25, and therefore, you know, obviously, if you're under 25, you're more likely to be unmarried, so a lot of these things could simply be associations. But I think it's quite interesting that the, um, those two, the, sort of the age and the gender thing, those are the same things which predict offending. So it's sort of a shame in a way that we haven't got um, in this data. You know, they don't ask people about their experiences of offending at the same time as they ask about their experiences of victimisation. If we had that, we'd be able to sort of see, you know, is there any sort of overlap between these people? It's a bit of a shame that we can't do that. But we can at least see whether um, it is the same kind of factors that predict um, being an offender and being a victim, as well as um, what other factors predict being a victim. Um, again, some things which predict being a non-victim, but again, you know, as I say, certainly no confidence that any of these are causal relationships. Um, One-off victims and household victims. And that's uh, it.